This is Business Analytics Using Forecasting, and I'm Galit Shmueli. Up to now, we've talked about forecasting quantitative or numerical data. However, often we need to generate binary forecasts. Binary forecasts mean that the forecast is going to be a zero or a one. It can also be a probability of an event. So in the next set of videos, we're going to look at forecasting binary events. The first thing to ask ourselves is what's going to be different about the forecasting process? The same process is going to be relevant for binary forecasts, but many of these steps will require something different about how we do them. So in these videos, we're going to look at each and every one of these different steps and see what needs to be done differently. Let's start by considering how the forecasting goal might be different and how the data would differ in the case of binary forecasts. When we're talking about the goals and the data, there are three very popular scenarios that we might have that lead to binary forecasts. The first scenario is when we want to forecast a direction of some numerical series. For example, we might have stock prices and we're not trying to predict the stock price, but rather we're trying to predict whether Tomorrow, the price is going to go up or it's going to go down. So in effect, our forecast is binary. But the data that we have are numerical. We might actually have the stock prices. A second scenario is when we have binary data, such as when we're trying to forecast whether next year is going to be a recession or not. Our data, our time series, is going to be a sequence of zeros and ones, where one might be a recession year and zero will be a year without a recession. So this is another scenario that's different. We do still want to generate a zero one forecast, but our data are themselves binary data. And the third scenario, which is also very common, is where our data are again numerical, such as blood pressure, but what we care about is whether this numerical value crosses a threshold of interest. For example, whether our blood pressure crosses some threshold that makes it dangerous for us. So again, here we have numerical data, or sometimes we just have the binary data. Maybe we have information only whether our blood pressure exceeded that threshold or not. In any case, our forecast is intended to be binary. So we've seen how the data would be different and how the goal might be different. Now let's see how we explore and visualize the series in a different way. Let's see an example to see how we would have to visualize binary forecasting in a different way. Suppose that we're interested in forecasting whether tomorrow it will rain in Melbourne, Australia. For this purpose, we download data from the website of the Melbourne Regional Office Station. In this example, we have daily data for almost 11 years. On each date, the data include the amount of rainfall in millimeters. Suppose that we don't care about the rainfall amount, but rather we only care if it rains or not. So we create a new derived variable called rain, which takes the value one if it rained on that day and zero otherwise. How can we visualize this new column? What will an ordinary time plot look like? Remember that we're trying to identify patterns such as trends and seasonality. If we just use a bar chart, then we'll have a flat horizontal line on no rain days, and then we'll have spikes on rainy days, but that's very difficult to view. Or if we use a line graph connecting these points, it won't make it easier to identify the patterns, especially if I have such a long series. So the ordinary line chart is not going to work for binary series. So instead, we're going to look at aggregated versions of the series. For example, here's a chart aggregated across all days in one month. The x-axis is the month of year. The y-axis is the percent of rainy days in that month. And each line denotes a single year. This plot clearly shows monthly seasonality. Moreover, the seasonality smoothly transitions between months. We can overlay different trend lines. Here, a polynomial trend line seems to capture the monthly seasonality. In summary, with a binary series, visualization is typically easier 
if we look at different aggregations of the series. So we see that defining the goal is different, the data might be different, and we're exploring and visualizing the series in a different way. How about the step of data partitioning, where we partition our data into training and validation periods? Well, the good news is that here, nothing really changes and we use the same approach. For example, here I might take the rain data and split it into two periods. In this example, I kept the last 667 days in the validation period. So my training starts from the beginning of 2000 and it ends on January 2nd of 2010. We see that the training length is 3,653 days. From these days, 1,300 were rainy and the rest were not rainy. The validation period is 667 days long. It starts on January 3rd of 2010 and it ends on October 31st of 2011. In the validation period, 273 days were rainy and the rest were not rainy. The next step is looking at benchmarks and we've talked about the naive benchmark when we're talking about quantitative forecasting. What happens when we look at binary forecasting? In the case of binary forecasting, we actually have two types of naive forecasts. The first one is the same as what we saw before. We look at the most recent period for which we have data and we just copy that value as our forecast. So the binary value of the previous period would be our naive forecast. Or we can use seasonal naive in the same way that we used it before. The second type of naive forecast that is useful in binary forecasting is called the majority vote. And what it does is it looks at our previous data and checks whether we had more ones or zeros, chooses the more popular one, a one or a zero, and that will be my majority vote forecast. That is a very simple forecast. It uses no model, but it will serve as another useful benchmark. Of course, if we're trying to forecast something very rare, then the majority vote will usually be pretty accurate. Try to think why that is true. Let's see an example of naive forecasts. On the left, we see the most recent value used as a one step ahead forecast. You can see that the values of the forecasts are equal to the value of the actual in the previous day. The residuals here are the actual minus the forecast as before. On the right side, we see the naive forecast for a fixed partitioning where our training ends on January 2nd, 2010. Since it rained on that day, all the forecasts for all the future days are equal to one. To compute the second type of benchmark for forecasting values in the validation period, we use the training period and see whether it had more rainy or non-rainy days. For fixed partitioning, we would see whether until January 2nd, 2010, there are more rainy or non-rainy days. Since there were indeed more rainy days than no rain days, our majority vote forecast is rain. Forecasts for the periods in the future after October 31st of 2011 would be based on combining the training and validation periods. In the combined period, there are more rainy days than non-rain days. So again, our majority vote forecast is rain. In the roll forward case, we would need to recompute the majority vote for each forecast because the training period is different. In this video, we focused on the first part of the forecasting process. We looked at defining the goals, getting data, exploring and visualizing a binary series. Then we talked also about partitioning the series. We saw that everything is actually a little bit different except for the data partitioning step. We also talked about a new type of benchmark that's useful in binary forecasting. In the next video, we're going to look at how to evaluate the performance of a binary forecasting model. And after that, we'll look at a few models and methods for forecasting binary events.